Congratulations, you've graduated with an arts degree. Hmm. In a tough economic climate, is it reasonable to expect to find gainful employment in your field? Joining us now to tell us what they're doing and plan to do with their arts degrees. Rochelle Sabarin, she is arts history major at York University. Bridget Kwame, health and wellness professional. Siavash Jushagani, philosophy major at York University. And Braden Hutchinson, continuing education teacher. And it's good to have all of you here at TVO tonight. Thanks for joining us for part two of our week-long series called Dude, Where's My Future? You're all young enough to remember the movie Dude, Where's My Car? So we sort of, we are playing off that title. Uh, okay, Bridgie, you want to get us started here? Sure. Where, where are you from? I'm originally from London, Ontario. Okay. Uh, moved to Toronto after graduation. And that was primarily because I was having difficulties finding a job in my field in my hometown. Where'd you go to school? I went to Western. For how many years? For four years and then one additional year. I thought I was going to go to med school, so I tried to do some additional courses and then changed my mind. So, changed your mind yeah. just and so they did not finish the fifth year? Uh, no, I didn't. I, it was just some additional courses to add on, but I had already graduated the year before. So Got it. And so you graduated with? With a bachelor in health sciences. Are you in debt? Yes. How much? Or when you got out of university, when how much? When I got much? out, uh, upwards of twenty-five grand. Twenty-five thousand mm dollars. -hmm. Okay, so you did not have uh, parents or a wealthy uncle to help pay your way through, or anything like that. No, sadly, no. So uh, OSAP was my friend and my enemy, um, <laughs> getting through, and is still kind of hanging on as I go through the the repayment. So twenty-five grand when you graduated, how many years ago? That was in two thousand six. Okay, but, yeah, seven, seven years, years ago, and you've whittled that down to how much now? Uh, I've got about. Four grand left, I think, to pay. Oh, yeah. so you're doing well. Almost there. Okay. Almost there, yeah. What are you doing now? I actually work at an agency for adults with brain injury. So hmm. I am, I guess, lucky enough to have followed a career path that fit with my initial degree. But I also have dabbled in blogging and freelance writing, which is now kind of taking off as a little bit more of an entrepreneurial stream for myself. Because you love to write. Pardon? You love to write. Definitely. Love to write. I've loved to write since I was a child, but it was something that wasn't really approached as a career path. Okay. So and I went into something more stable, which and was how old? I'm 30. You're 30. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Thank you for starting it out. No We're going to go around the horn here, or around the table, I should say, and, uh, and then we'll get into some deeper questions after we learn a little bit more about who you are, Rochelle. Hi. <laughs> so um, you are from where? I'm from Mississauga, originally. How old are you? 21. Where'd you go to post-grad? Um, or post-secondary, rather? Uh, I started at Simon Fraser University in BC. Oh. Um, I did my first year in psychology. And then I switched to York University for English. And then now I'm in art history. And why the switches? Um, well, I started in psych because I thought I wanted to go into social work and like addictions counseling. And then English because I realized I do not have the science or math background to do that. <laughs> And um, I always enjoyed writing, same thing. And then finally I realized I enjoy art so much, but I'm not very good at making it, so I want to study it. <laughs> do you think you've found the thing yes, now? Yes, I've now landed, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> How do you know? Because um, I'm comfortable and I'm finally enjoying my classes, yeah. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. uh, are you in any kind of student debt right now? Yes. To Am the I tune of? 25, yeah. You're at 25,000? Yes. And what year are you in at York? I'm in my fourth year right now. So by the time you graduate, you will be how much in debt? Well, I'm planning on taking a fifth year, so we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. party's not over yet. No, it, ideally I'd like to get a master's or a PhD. So okay. I've, I've got a lot more debt to go. <laughs> so you are not one year away, you may be two or three or four years away. Or seven. Or seven years away. Yeah. <laughs> now how are you managing to, uh, to fund this? Um, loans, OSAP, also a good friend of mine. <laughs> And um, luckily I have supportive parents that also kind of built artistic careers from the ground up. So they're, they have my back. <laughs> they are simpatico to your situation. Yes. Good. Yeah. Well, speaking of art, you're covered in it. Yeah. Can we see some of your art? <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. First of all, on your shoulder. Yes. That's, that looks like a rose window from Well, it's a, a kind of a mix from a couple of them. But um, originally the history behind rose windows, they were called Catherine windows. And my mother's name is Catherine, and she's a stained glass artist, ah, so it's for her. Perfect. Mm -hmm. And on your forearm? Um, I have the word linger on, so it's kind of my leave your mark tattoo. Nice. Yeah. Inside? Um, an M for my sister Melissa, and she has an R for Rochelle. And then I have quotation marks <laughs> from when I was an English major. Now, the quotation marks have to go the other way. Though. Yeah, so that yeah. I can see them. So right now you're in quotes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's great. Yeah. Okay. And... Um, where do you live? 
I live downtown Toronto. Yeah. So you, how do you pay rent and pay tuition and make it all happen? Um, with help of my parents, and I have like I've done a lot of weird jobs over the years to try and pay my dues that don't have anything to do with my degree really. But you know, Gotta pay the bills. Yeah. Retails Are you working right now? Right now, no, because I just started school again. So that's my that's my job right now. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Sivash, you ready? Where are you from? Uh, Toronto. And where'd you go to post-secondary? Uh, well, I went to University of Toronto. I did electrical engineering. Electrical engineering? Yeah. Okay. How long ago was that? That was, I graduated in 2008. Okay. You're 29 yeah. now? Yes. Okay. And are you working? Uh, no. I was working for five years, but uh, philosophy got to me. I decided to do philosophy. Okay, interesting. What were you working at for five years? I was working in finance. Like it? Mm, I loved it, yeah. And it was, why it, did you stop doing it? Well, I, after I paid my student debts, I decided to try a different, you know, try to go back to what I always wanted to do. And that was always philosophy. Uh, I loved my job, but uh, I thought it was time to, you know, follow what I liked. This is very interesting because you got the job. And yeah. most, I think, post-secondary students with the degree think, now that I've got the job, I'm on the way. And yet you stopped being on the way and decided to go study something that most people think won't lead to a job at all, <laughs> namely philosophy. Yes. So as they used to say on that old TV show, explain, Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, when I started engineering, I wanted to do philosophy at first, but uh, my math was good. And I decided to do engineering because it, was, it seemed more practical at the time. It turned out it was more practical. And by the time uh, I got the job, uh, I worked really hard and saved a lot while I was working. And that helped me a lot in paying down my debt really quickly. And after that, I stopped paying rent and moved back to my parents. Which uh, was where? Which was in North York, okay. North York, Toronto. And uh, then I quit my job. I canceled my cell phone plan, I stopped going out drinking as much, <laughs> and I started doing school. And you had managed to retire your student debt from before, is that right? Yes, that's right. So have you incurred more debt now to go back to school? Well, that's the funny part. I was entitled to zero dollars for OSAP just because I just started philosophy. I, I started philosophy uh, nine months ago. And because of that, uh, because I had uh, income before, I wasn't entitled to any OSAP. So I'm just paying university from my savings from when I was working. And do you have a part-time job right now as you're going to school? Uh, not now. No. no. You intend to? Uh, I don't think so. I did my shuttle work. So now, you want to focus on the studies? Yeah, I'm not a, like, I like, to, I like to do multiple things, but when it's my passion, I like to focus on it. Well, let's explore that for a second. Siavash, what does studying philosophy do for you that clearly working in finance did not? Well, it was uh, part of developing myself in a field that uh, inspires me to do more. When I was in engineering, I liked what I did, but it never inspired me to do more in it. Like, I never inspired to do a, to do a master's degree or get a PhD. Uh, I never even imagined it. And when I went to finance, I went there because, well, back then, the banks were doing when the economy was doing better. Mm -hmm. So they hired a lot of engineers. And the, the pay was good, I'm not going to lie. And uh, What did you make? Best salary. <laughs> uh, per month. Or per year, however you want to measure it. What oh. was your best salary? <laughs> it was about uh, $75,000. Okay, that's a good income for a guy in his 20s. Very good, okay. yeah. And now you're in first year of how many to go? I've got, uh, well, a year and a half to go. You got a year and a half to go. Yeah, well, they let me sit in fourth year. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I did, I took philosophy elective courses when I was doing my engineering. So they accepted all that, all those courses. Uh -huh. So they let me sit <clears throat> much, uh, much more ahead. Great. So you're yeah. more than halfway there already. Yeah. Okay. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, okay. Braden, shall we? Sure. Where are you from? Uh, originally, I'm from Huntsville, actually, in Muskoka. Um, moved to Ottawa for school about 12 years ago. Which university? 
Uh, Carlton, uh, then U of O, and back to Carlton, then down to Queens. So I've been around the block a few times. Why so many switches? Uh, well, I wasn't switches. I actually did my BA, and then I did my B.Ed at U of O. Uh, so I'm a teacher. Uh, and then I did my master's at Carleton, and I'm just wrapping up my PhD at Queens, actually. And you're 30. I am. So you've been going to school for 26 years. Yep. <laughs> Since I was four. <laughs> you got it. You loving it? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I always enjoyed school. School is, was a place that I always felt comfortable, uh, particularly in the academic side of things. Um, you know, I, I enjoyed it. It was something I was always passionate about, so I guess I just stuck around. How bit. have you afforded all these different tuitions at all these different universities? Well, I started work when I was 14, and I used to work between 24 and 32 hours a week when I was in high school. At what? Uh, at a retail job. Um, so I did that, and then when I went away to university, I had jobs, and you know, a little over a dozen scholarships later, and um, while I've been doing my master's and PhD, I was working as a teacher and a TA and a prof at Queen's. Uh, so, you know, essentially a combination of scholarships and work. Um, I did end up in a little bit of debt for my master's, mm -hmm. about uh, 20 grand, but I paid that off in two years, so. Hmm. Um, are you debt free right now? Yep, absolutely. You are. Yeah. Okay. And are you working right now? I have three jobs, You actually. have three jobs? I have three jobs. Um, so the people who were on last night's program are mad because you've got two of the ones they want. <laughs> well, um, I don't know if they want my jobs okay, necessarily. Tell us. Um, tell us. So I'm a supply teacher on the one hand, so that's, uh, Right now, that's a large bulk of my income. Uh, so I've been doing that for about seven years. Supply teaching where? Um, in Ottawa, okay. for one of the school boards there. Um, as a, um, the other job that I have is I work retail, about 20 hours a week, uh, stocking shelves at a grocery store, uh, just because it provides a little bit of stability for the year, times when you know supply teaching isn't so great. And then uh, I also run my own business, which does uh, education, research, and communication consulting. So everything from writing and um, you know to doing archival research or doing data analysis or literature reviews. Or um, I also run my own server for online education. So I design courses for people from time to time. So a little bit of everything. You are Braden Hutchinson, Omnimedia Inc. Generalist. You're all over. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Good for you. Uh, how's it going? It's, uh, it's a little crazy right now. Uh, yeah. It's busy. Um, obviously, I mean, the dream, um, at least uh, in its most modest form, was that you would be able to make a living you know, and be able to pay rent and buy groceries with one job. Um, that's just not the reality today. Um, when we have minimum wages that are below what Statistics Canada identifies as a living wage, uh, you can understand why people like me might have two or three jobs and why it's such a crisis in terms of finding a good, a good job. For students, because the fact is, is that our employers aren't making good jobs, by and large. They're making terrible jobs. You've taken us exactly where I want to go right now, which is the expectations you had uh, when you started your university lives, and where you are right now in your lives, and whether those things are meeting or not the slightest bit in comparison to where you thought you'd be at this stage of the game. Go ahead. Well, for me, it's, it's a bit of both. So. I was always interested in health from a young age as well. My mom is a nurse, so she kind of inspired me to follow this path. And even though writing was something that was another love, writing was looked at as more of a hobby. So health was something where you can get a good job and you can have a pension and all that good stuff. So in post-secondary, my plan was go through health sciences, maybe go to med school, maybe do my master's in physiotherapy, you know, work my way up and do something with myself. My parents, or especially my father, always wanted me to have letters behind my name. So when I said med school, he was like, that's great. He's still asking me about med school, and it's not going to happen. How many letters <laughs> you got behind your name now? Um, I like to add my own letters. So I like to say, you know, Bridget Kwame, I am fabulous. Like, those are the letters that you get, right? Because, I mean, you, you make it your own, right? OK, so. but, but, but the actual letters that universities VHSC, have given you? VHSC, VHSC, yes, VHSC. Okay. So, um, you know, once I left university and I finished at Western and decided to move to Toronto to, um, to get out of my hometown, I did kind of follow that path. I got a really great job working in international health and was there for a good few years. I started taking some courses at George Brown in health promotion and just kind of to diversify some of my skills. But what I found now is even though on one hand I could look back and say, all right, you know, University Bridget probably would have looked at my nine to five and said, all right, this is kind of what you're aiming for. 
what 30-year-old Bridget now is realizing is that may not be the true passion that I've always had for myself. So similarly to what Siavash was saying about kind of having that realization about what the passion is, um, now I'm trying to find a way to make that work. So looking at writing as not just a hobby, but what can I do to make this more of an entrepreneurial idea, um, a side hustle is what I call a it. Side hustle. A side hustle. So is this a bit of a course correction for you? Do you want to call it that? In a way, in a way, what I would love to do is find a way to bridge both aspects. So to bridge some of the writing and communication and those things with my health background, which I kind of do on my own. As I write my blog, I like to write about lots of health and wellness um, topics and discussions as well. But nobody's really paying me for that at this point. So it's kind of just a labor of love. And I'm finding a way to make that labor of love a labor that's going to add to my bank account and help pay <laughs> off some of this residual OSAP and, and find a way to bridge those things. So I mean, different things in life happen where you realize that it's not just about the stability. It's not just about the job that's going to pay you well. It's about what's going to make you happy. And as kind of, you know, altruistic and lovely as that sounds, I think it's very important. No, agreed. That's, I mean, yeah. Rochelle, I was going to say, when I was your age, what they said was find something you love to do and figure yeah. out how to get paid for it. Yeah. Now, <laughs> do, is that still the plan for you? Yes, 100%. And what's the plan then? I have two. So plan number one is be a professor of, like, contemporary art. And then the other one would be find a way to become an aesthetic consultant is the, the title I like right now. What does now. that mean? Making things pretty. So <laughs> For whom? For anyone. So I think a lot of businesses could benefit from having people with arts degrees consulting on anything. It's, there's a whole other perspective in the arts world that doesn't get to branch over with the actual economy that matters in a city. Like galleries are great, love going to museums, all that stuff is fabulous, but those are very hard worlds to break into. But I would like to be able to work in business or management or something like that and help the CEOs and the top guys make their businesses more available to a different crowd. Hmm. So, Do you think the education you're getting now genuinely is putting you on a path to realize that? I do, because art history for me wasn't necessarily about learning about the Renaissance and Baroque or whatever. I just wanted to have enough education to back myself up in any scenario. I've had a job with the Toronto Fringe Festival where I was their um, visual fringe coordinator. So I got to basically do what I wanted to do and help curate design, work with artists, and help run the festival from an aesthetic point. And that kind of made it real for me, that I, I created my own position there and worked with amazing people. Even though it's a theater industry, I still got to be a visual arts person. So it's how to combine what I love but also be practical about it, mm -hmm. which is why teaching is also a really good option because being a professor means getting to talk about what I love and write books and interact with students about things that interest me and hopefully interest them. Your parents are still around? Yes. When you told your parents that you wanted a course correction, mm. no pun intended, <laughs> uh, and you wanted to take art history, mm -hmm. what was their reaction? Finally. <laughs> like, finally. Yeah. Yeah, was finally. Huh. And, then, and then there was the hesitation about like a month afterwards being like, so you're good with this one? You're okay now? <laughs> We're not switching anymore? But and they haven't asked you, you really think you can get a job out of this? No, they're, they're very supportive. Um, I, my mom was an artist while I was growing up and still is. And my dad uh, does business consulting and business improvisation consulting um, and also started his own business. So they're very supportive in me following what I want to do. And they, they have faith that I can make it work. Great. See, Bash, you are the poster child for what everybody says is, you know, an impossibility for finding work afterwards, which is the guy with the philosophy degree. So what's your plan? Well, uh, my plan is to finish philosophy first and get a, hopefully get a master's degree. And if the student that's piled up again, I have Canadian work experience. So I'll just go back to the job market to pay off the debt. And then maybe after I'll do a PhD. Uh, but that I won't fill your heart, right? You're uh, taking philosophy because it yes. fills your heart. Yes, but I would like to keep my passion separate from something that makes me money. I think I have experienced uh, mixing passion with making money. And uh, for me, it doesn't do it. For me, uh, when I stop, uh, it just becomes for something else. Like I can't do it at the same time when I make money. Like, uh, and philosophy, uh, you can't make money, a lot of money out of it. Um, I wanted to do, when I was in engineering, I, I was always thinking about uh, doing something in engineering that would involve uh, like a small entrepreneurship project or some sort of small startup. 
Um, and it turns out that once you angle it towards something, it, in engineering at least, once you angle it towards something that makes money, then it loses that aspect of following science and following research. And for philosophy, it's the same way. I, I'm not looking to make money out of philosophy. Uh, to make money, I'll just go back to, to finance or, or to engineering. Okay, so you're not looking to make money from philosophy, but are, are your parents still around? Yes. When you told them you wanted to scrap the good paying $75,000 a year job, uh, to go back to university and take philosophy, their reaction was? Well, their first reaction was, what are you going to study? I said philosophy, and then they, they, they were really supportive. They were really supportive, but my dad keeps encouraging me to apply to law school. <laughs> <laughs> so supportive, but? Yes. Yeah, he keeps encouraging me to apply to law school, and that's a lot of, that's a lot of more debt. And maybe I'll consider it. Like, after I do I get my master's, I may get like a sense of peace from following my passion for at least a few years. So maybe I'll apply to law school or do an MBA. I don't know. I already did the GMAT. You want to be a lawyer? <laughs> I don't know. You don't know? That doesn't no. sound like a guy who's desperate to be a lawyer. <laughs> well, I would like to help people if, if by being a lawyer I can do that, yeah. But that, if I, even if I end up being a lawyer, I will, I will do it as, I will not uh, complement it with my hobby. Like, I will not be a lawyer in philosophy. No, <laughs> I get I you. will not get, like, a law degree in philosophical legal <laughs> issues. I will go into, straight into, like, some sort of corporate law or poverty law or something but like if the that. But I mean, if the idea in life, and by extension the idea behind this program, is find something you love to do, figure out if you can get paid doing that, you love philosophy. Yeah. Have you been able to figure out a way to for lack of a better word, monetize that love? Uh, no. No, I, and I, I don't think I, I want to. I, I, would, I would love it if it would have paid off, uh, but it doesn't, and I have to be realistic, realistic about that. And that's the choice that I decided to make. And my lifestyle has changed from when I was working. Obviously, I don't make the same income anymore, but uh, a lot of perks that I decided not to continue having. Right. Uh, they're not hurting me because I am doing what I like. And when I go back to work, then those perks are going to come back. So I'm still going to be happy. <laughs> well, that's good. That's a good outlook. Uh, just give me a second here, guys. I would like to, Mary Taz, you're in the control room listening. I would still love to put these charts up now if we can. Is that all right with you? Because I think, actually, given what Siavash has just put on the table here, these charts speak to some of that. So these are a little complicated, guys. Check the monitors in the studio here. This is the Education Return on Investment, a study that CIBC did. And what these bars show are what graduates earning less than half the median income are doing. And we in Canada, I don't know how many people know this, we have the largest percentage of our population with post-secondary education of all OECD countries. And yet we also have the largest chunk, if you compare us to the US, the UK, the OECD average, France and Korea, we have the largest chunk of both college and university graduates who are earning less than half the median income. College a little more than university, which is unusual because theoretically they're supposed to be the more direct line to a job with that. And who are these folks in particular who are dealing with this? Let's flip over to the next chart. And you can see it's the, it's the people with the psychology major, the humanities, the social sciences, and education who are the graduates in Canada who are earning less than half the median income. And obviously, as you get closer to, see, Yvonne, there's engineering. Bridget, there's health. Mm -hmm. There's business as well. Uh, obviously, the numbers start to improve as you get closer to those kinds of occupations. But that, those, those charts seem to confirm what we instinctively hear all the time, which is if you want to pursue your passion and go into psychology or social <coughs> services or uh, philosophy, you're going to have a tougher time making a living. And I want to know why that doesn't deter you. Um, well, I mean, it does because I know that I'm not going to be living the quality of lifestyle that I would like to for a long time, but I would much rather be happy and immersed in a culture that I enjoy than be working a nine to five behind a desk that's making me sad. 
I would, I would much rather be happy and broke and living in a crappy apartment than rich in a condo and hating my job every day. Braden, how about you? Well, I, it was always sort of instilled with me, and I find this continues to be true. It doesn't matter what you study. What matters is what you do with it. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, I have three degrees now in history and one in education. So, you know, I'm right on, at the top of that list of uh, <laughs> cautionary tales, I guess you might you're, say. You're all full of humanities, aren't I'm you? I'm full of humanities, <laughs> uh, as, as well as other stuff sometimes. But anyway, uh, the, the issue is, right, is that um, if you look at that chart, the bottom end, where we mentioned, oh, business and engineering also show up on there. I think we forget that these, these trends have a kind of um, temporal aspect to them in the sense that you know, if you looked at teaching, uh, say, 10, 15 years ago, it's a very different picture, right? Grads were getting jobs. But what happened? Uh, well, since about the end of the 90s, we've been producing four teachers for every single retiree because of the decision that was made by governments and universities to expand enrollment in those pro programs. Well, in, in part to meet a demand that people, people wanted those well, jobs. Not, not a demand on the education student side, not a demand in the labor market. And I'm not, I'm not making the argument that they need to necessarily entirely correlate. But come on, four teachers for every retiree? You can't tell me that you know, that was purely accidental or coincidental. I mean, it was clear that they were cashing in on the desire to be teachers. And that's what the decision that those universities made. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the other side of this, right, is that I'm already hearing whispers some, from some of my friends who finished law, who've done other stuff that schools are having trouble placing their articling students now, because they have too many of them. Because those programs have expanded too, especially since the Ray Report in 2005, right? Uh, where we've seen the number of people in graduate and professional programs literally double since 2005. Mm -hmm. So education, because it's a flat um, profession, is just sort of the tip of the iceberg. Well, the same thing is potentially coming down the pipe for others. I want to push back a little bit here. Sure, and, absolutely. And, uh, if you learn more, you earn more. Every study shows that, sure. right? And if you go, now, mind you, the, the gap in how much better you will do if you have post-secondary education is less now than it's been in many, many years. So it's not the advantage that it once was, but it's still an advantage. Absolutely. I mean, you, you can't imagine going back, I presume, right? No. You want that education. Yeah. Has it taken you, though, to where you thought or hoped you'd be at this stage of your life? Not 100%. Not 100%, but kind of the other way I look at the idea of it and something that Rochelle had mentioned as far as the creation of your own job. So, I mean, once you've gone through university, there's so much we can look back and say woulda, coulda, shoulda. You know, if I knew what I knew now, I would have done things differently. But you can't go back. And that's kind of where I look at it now. I would love to, you know, kind of do what um, Sia Vash is doing and go back to school and investigate, you know, media, a degree in media, or you know, English, or journalism. But I don't think it's really that feasible. So for me, what it's been about is looking at what I have and what I can do now. And a large portion of that is what can I kind of create on my own? What can I do to kind of package myself as a brand with all of these different skills and abilities and passions and offer that? Now, is that what you wanted to do, or is that what you have to do? Because the job yeah. right. isn't out there. That's it. The job isn't there, so you have to create it. Um, especially when it comes to things these days with social media and, and digital journalism and those types of things. Those are just branching out. Those are just becoming very new. And people don't really know what to do with those. So I do social media consulting, for example, on the side. And when I you know, go to small businesses and say, hey, you have a Facebook. It's dead. You have a Twitter. You've had three tweets since 2009. I can help you out with that, and this is going to be great. A lot of them don't even understand what that is. Hmm. So it's, it's taken me to a different aspect of, all right, you know, when I can do some continuing ed classes at George Brown or wherever, I'll do those. When I can't, I'm on the internet, and I'm learning, and I'm teaching myself, and I'm doing workshops. And then I'm building those skills on my own to kind of create something for myself. So I'm at this point now where I'm not really waiting for somebody to kind of pluck my resume out and say, hey, you look great for what I already have. I'm kind of more in the vein now of thinking of what kind of niche or what kind of little corner can I create for myself and, and see if maybe that might get the ball rolling. I feel like with the, you know, you're on Workopolis, you're looking for all these different things, you're trying to get your resume out there. And a lot of the times, I think a lot of people don't recognize the skills they inherently possess and just a different way to kind of sell that and package hmm. that. So, Rochelle, let me, I guess I'm going to give you the last word here. Uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago, people graduated from whatever post-secondary they had. 
and they look for the job. Um, that's probably not going to be your future. No, I, I totally agree with what you're saying with branding. I think branding is a huge, um, a huge advantage that I could give myself now because there are thousands of artists in Toronto. There's so many people with art degrees and doing artistic things. And how do you how do you make yourself better than the rest of them, or different, or unique? And I think branding is the answer to that. I, I'm. I won't just be a student or a teacher or a artist, whatever. I need to brand me, Rochelle, as my own thing, and this is what I can help you do. Here's what I can do. Do you want any of these things? As opposed to, what would you like from me? Um, I've, I've done too many unpaid internships to be the coffee slave anymore, <laughs> and now I'm ready to be, here's what I can offer you. You know, like I don't, I don't want to do your photocopies, but I could design your display window for you. <laughs> cool. Yeah. You are, I mean, you're, you're wearing your branding. Yes. You're branded yeah. all over. You're going to be unforget pretty unforgettable after this one's over. Thanks. Guys, thanks so much for coming in tonight and helping us out with this. Mm -hmm. Really great to meet you all. Rochelle Sabrin, the art history major at York University. Bridget Kwame, the health and wellness professional. Sivash Jushagani, philosophy major, York University. Braden Hutchinson, the continuing education teacher. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, we're going to broaden our discussion now and find out where the jobs are with two individuals who spend a lot of time thinking about this problem. But first, here is the mayor of Calgary, Nahid Nenshi, on what he wishes he could tell his 23-year-old self. Watch. So the 23-year-old Nahid was working on Bay Street in Toronto, making a lot of money, thinking about graduate school. He thought he had it going on. Uh, and what I would say to the 23-year-old Nahid is a couple of things. Number one, that 23-year-old body does not return. Keep going to the gym and make sure you don't let it slide. Number two, remember that there's a lot more in life than that paycheck. You know it. You know it inside your heart. But remember that you, even at 23, have the power to make real change in your community, just like everyone else does. Get on it. Calgary Mayor Nahid Nenshi. If you can't find a job with a Bachelor of Arts degree, what can you expect to gain from the experience and what should the role of higher education be in getting you there? Joining us now to help answer that, Tony Chambers. He's Department Chair of Leadership, Higher and Adult Education at OISE. And we welcome back Rafael Gomez. He is Professor of Employment Relations at the University of Toronto and author of the forthcoming book, The Little Black Book for Managers. And it's good to have you guys both back here in the studio. I just want to start with some initial reactions to what you heard. Tony, want to get us started? You know, what I heard was something really interesting from the students. And uh, the central message was um, this generation senses that they have some options about their employment choices. Regardless of what they've done in post-secondary and regardless of what uh, we say about uh, the financial situation in post-secondary education or the quality of post-secondary education. They've taken the reins, much like this generation has, has done. And it made me wonder, as I was listening to them, if all the hype about um, uh, post-secondary education leading to employment and the cost of post-secondary education being a, turrent, a deterrent for students uh, and the quality of offerings in post-secondary education is much more about what we say outside of the student life uh, as opposed to what students are actually uh, experiencing. There may be a difference there. I, I'm, I'm, that's what sort of uh, came up for me when I was listening hmm. to him. Is it us or is it them creating all the hype about uh, this post-secondary education dilemma? Gotcha. Rafael? Yeah, uh, I was struck by all of the, uh, the um, students and graduates by how much they uh, spoke to the vision of education as elicited by enlightenment thinkers. You know, there's been this, I mean, they wouldn't have characterized it that way, but what they were really talking about is education is a place where you find your voice, you find your critical way of accessing the world, and you become a free person who interacts with other people on terms of equality. You know that the 21-year-old the, the art student um, who said, look, I'm tired of doing all these unpaid internships. I, if I'm going to work for someone from now on, I'm going to offer my services for a paid wage. And I have something that is uh, a value out there in the market. But she discovered that through testing the waters. And she did have to change degrees. She even had to change universities, mm -hmm. a costly endeavor. But her, her true mission is to find that voice, find that aspect of her personality and her abilities that she can engage with. And so for those who say university is all about trying to find a job, you say no. It's about trying to find a voice. 
That's right. But in the course of finding your voice, you find jobs and you <laughs> find opportunities and you find doors that open that you hadn't thought were there. Hmm. Um, yeah. Tony, mm -hmm. let me put to you one of the things that, that we've heard over the last certainly couple of days of doing this series and of course in the, in the years previously in covering these stories. Mm -hmm. The millennials today, there seems to be this sense that the millennials today have it tougher. That there's something about this great recession and looking for work, carrying student debt, all of that in this great recession, mm -hmm. which is different from those who graduated into the teeth of the recession of the 90s or those who graduated into the recession of the early 80s. Mm -hmm. Is it different? I, I think a lot about what we frame as millennials. Th their life is, is, is quite different. Uh, imagine those growing up in a time when um, most of what you've experienced is, is world war. They grew up in a life where there was war. They grew up in a life when geopolitics sort of shifted from what we understood uh, growing up. Imagine a world when this is the first generation when uh, you couldn't say that your life would be better than your parents' life if you, did, mm -hmm. if you made some of the same decisions or different, better decisions. Mm -hmm. These young people grew up in a life of uncertainty, right? A life where technology and, and the digitized world is sort of driving their sense of value and what's, their sense of purpose and what's, what's meaningful to them. Uh, so they've had to manage all of this change and the change is at a pace that's quite different than the change of uh, the pace of change uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago. So it's not just the economy that's different. It, it's not just uh, post-secondary education and the value of that. It is actually the world that they live in. It, it's quite different and they've managed. I have a lot of hope for them because they've managed uh, to negotiate much of this transformation and have come out of it in some ways with a different sense of self and purpose. So I, I'm quite pleased with the generation that, that's, that's there now, the millennials or whatever, and what they've dealt with and how they've dealt with it. So. The previous generation, Raphael, may have had to grow up with uh, nightmares about the Cold War and the yeah. world going, you know, yeah. being on a nuclear precipice. Yeah. But at the end of the day, that war didn't happen. Yeah. But this generation has seen the Twin Towers in New York yeah. brought down. Absolutely. So they do they do have more maybe psychologically going on than we did. Uh, I don't know. I mean, that's, a, that's one event. The thing mm -hmm. of the Cold War, the very aftermath, a very big event, but it was mm -hmm. one event, um, and there was a, a consequence to that event, and, and, a, and a war that, that uh, did embroil um, at least the United States and, and a lot of Western powers for quite a long time, both in Afghanistan and Iraq, for sure. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, the Cold War was a, was a multi-generational phenomenon, and there have been studies, research done by academics to, to actually see if that generation affected by the Cold War behaved differently. Did, did they save a little more as a result? And did they, you know, these sort of things. And they, there have been effects. So most definitely events can impact a generation. Um, but, you know, going back to the question, you know, is this particular recession different from others? Uh, yes and no. You know, the, the early 80s recession was far worse in its impact. The unemployment rate for everyone was much higher in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. So the generation that entered the labor market in the early 80s sort of tail end of the baby boom or the start of the generation X. If you want to be born, you want to be born uh, at the start of a baby boom or at a bust. You don't want to be born at the <laughs> end of a baby boom because you're entering right. the labor market after those forces of expansion have ebbed. So the early 80s would have been terrible anyway. The fact that there was an oil shock and a recession made it even worse. So that generation who are now in their 40s, late 40s, 50s, had it worse statistically in terms of their pr propensity to get a job. and. and and than so the ones on. today. Oh, yeah. Mm. yeah. 20% unemployment, and yet, by the way, for youth in the early 80s. Huh. And yet we hear yeah. that it's worse today. The sense we get is that it's worse today. But look, the, the recession then uh, was a short one, and, and it did uh, recover. The recovery was, it was more of a standard recession. Plants closed because there was a shock, and they reopened. In the 90s, what you had were plant closures that never reopened. Right. This was the adjustment following NAFTA and the FTA, and the shifting of, of work uh, and the deindustrialization of many jobs. Look in my neighborhood. I grew up in Scarborough, West Scarborough, and uh, in, in my neighborhood, uh, I still had friends who worked the last shifts at a GM plant in Scarborough, hmm. uh, making vans yeah. for a summer job, and that was great. You didn't get into debt. You worked a couple, you know, a couple shifts a week in the summer, and you made your money. Those jobs left. So that was the difference with the '90s. Trying to attain, as we come full yeah. circle here, trying to attain that same nice middle class, two cars, single family dwelling vacation once a year, that's harder for the millennials than, than it would have been for previous generations. Is that right? I think it's harder, but I, I, 
And what's hard about it is the timing at which one achieves that. Mm -hmm. I think it takes a bit longer, mm -hmm. but it can be achieved. But it's, it's taking a bit longer. It takes uh, a bit longer to double income, um, depending on your education level and other factors. Uh, it takes a bit longer to accumulate uh, net worth, which is the wealth that's transferable, uh, assumedly, um, than it did in previous generations. Uh, it's also uh, more difficult to accumulate the, um, uh, the actual dollar value that our parents and, of course, myself accumulated during that time period. So, yeah, it's, it's attainable. Uh, On the other hand, they're yeah. going to inherit their boomer parents' homes and wealth in probably larger numbers than previous generations would have. I would like to think so. I'm not convinced of that. No? Uh, and Raphael probably could respond more to the economics of this, but my sense um, is that um, many of these parents who accumulated wealth during a period of time have begun to, lost, begin to lose the wealth hmm. and begin to lose and are actually living off of what would have been their children's inheritance. Uh, so much of that might be uh, on the way out or might just be being used right now in order to sustain a level of existence uh, and may not be available for the young people and their families. Hmm. I want to bring this chart up one more time that we brought up for the earlier discussion just so I can get you guys to comment on this. Control room, can we do this? This is the education return on investment. So if you're a graduate of something closer to the left-hand side of the chart, mm -hmm. you are going to be earning less than the median income of everybody else in society. So, you know, not surprisingly here, psychology, if you've got a degree in the humanities, social sciences, education, mm -hmm. you're going to be doing less well than if you're in, for example, engineering, health, or business, where you'll do better than the rest of the population. Do post-secondary grads you have to ask the question then, really have a leg up on everybody else in the job market? Rafael. Uh, well, uh, I'll give you a, a general statistic. Um, Tom Koken, who's a professor of industrial relations at MIT and colleagues, did work in the US, albeit, uh, on the returns to education. All right? This is an update on work that's been done by labor economists for, for many, many years. But this is the interesting thing. They found there is still a premium to a university education, regardless of what it is. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't keep up with the productivity gains that firms have made over the last 10, 15 years. So regardless of where you are on that chart, fine, business students are doing relatively better than psychology students. All of them, as paid earners, are making less than the productivity gains that they've been achieving for industry. Hmm. So in other words, we're getting less, all of us collectively, uh, as workers, as employees. So the productivity gains haven't been shifted down to those who are earning them. So regardless of where you end up, on that scale, relative, everyone's doing worse. That's the bigger point. Not the companies. Say no, the company. no, the companies are. are companies are doing fine. Doing fine yeah. Sure. I mean, the employees to an are doing less well. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, what are the forces that are acting on uh, graduates and, and new entrants in the labor market that aren't allowing uh, wages to increase in the way they had in the past? And there are a variety of reasons. Uh, the deinstitutionalization of labor markets. We talked about it a little bit before. Mm -hmm. um, Sort of the, uh, the lack of uh, standardized wage for many occupations, which would have fallen in those branches that were at the left side of that diagram. Mm -hmm. uh, jobs that normally would have had a union contract and some uplifting of the bottom uh, are gone. And so, so that's, a, that's a big institutional uh, effect that we have to take into consideration. So, so Tony, people going into university or college, they know this. They, they understand this situation, that if I go into the humanities versus engineering, the chances are I'm going to have a lower income then. Okay. And yet, more students seem to be gra uh, gravitating, yeah. uh, not towards the high higher paying fields, but rather to perhaps what they're interested in or what they love or what turns them on. Yes. Does that make sense to you? Total. Makes, makes total sense. And, I, and, I, and, it, and, and what it's about is it's about the conversation we're having not being the right conversation. <laughs> right? The, the conversation about uh, the benefits of post-secondary education should be a lot broader than just about its, its economic purposes, as Raphael mentioned in his previous response. And the, the problem with keeping it within the economic realm is that, um, is that when, when those who make decisions about the cost of education, about what parents and others should expect for their offspring about education, when they catch wind of how education is being sold as an economic mm. uh, tool, as an economic engine mm. for their offspring, uh, the policymakers will say something to the effect, well, if it's, 
primarily to generate uh, individual economic outcomes, which is how we sell it. You know, we always say, you know, if you graduate mm -hmm. with a, a bachelor's degree or with a higher education degree, you'll make a million dollars more of a lifetime than somebody yeah. else. All but of us have done this. The numbers show that. The, show, the numbers you, will show you that. You learn more, you earn more. Honestly, but what the numbers don't show is that there are these things called externalities. There, there's things that happen as a result of people attending post-secondary mm -hmm. education that may not have a dollar value to it. There's less crime amongst yeah. those. There's better health amongst those. There's more philanthropic activities, volunteerism, contributions uh, to charities and so forth and so on. There are levels of these things. Now, if you, if you need to, you could attach dollars to those because it's saving somebody something, right? But we don't sell the story that way. We only talk about you get these million dollars over a mm -hmm. lifetime or 250,000 is what some of the, some of the uh, research tells us. And it's different for colleges and universities. So we need to restructure the narrative about the benefits of post-secondary education. These, are, these people who are on the panel, they understand that. And those who are choosing humanities, philosophy, Art I history. think they understand yeah. the bigger value Okay, so tell me, why do universities persist with this narrative that says, come to us, you'll get a better job at the end of the day, when, as Tony said, that shouldn't be the argument? Ah, uh, well, that's a bigger question. I mean, I, I, I don't... <laughs> what we profess, do here, my friend. I know that's we a big question. bigger questions. I, I, I'm not in charge of university policy yet. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but uh, I think part of it is the pressure built around uh, uh, parents' interest in what uh, students end up doing as a university, especially if they're financing greater portions of these expenses. Um, the, the need for security and safety. You know, if you tell people there's a job at the end of this degree and it pays better, then you'll do better. But even on those terms, you could, you could say, look, the people, what reason people are choosing degrees which are paying less is because the jobs are better quality jobs. And in economics, we talk about compensating differentials. You, know, you, you do something that's a little more interesting or you, you volunteer part of your time and it turns into a job, uh, but that's because you, you did it for a passion. And, and the working conditions are such that you will take a lower wage. The reason you're being paid a lot in a finance job is it's hard-boiled, it's pressure-filled, and our, you know, our, our graduate attested to that. He, danger pay. Yeah, there was a yep. bit of danger pay. It's stressful. Yep. You know, he earned a good living uh, coming out of university for sure, but he, he realized that he had bigger pursuits and he's willing to take a pay cut to mm -hmm. do the things he likes, which is a Per perfectly fine and is something that we could, as universities, uh, do a better job of selling. Do you think, though, that we still live in a world where, as we were told one or two or three generations ago, find something you love to do, figure out how to get paid for it? Do can we still do that? Uh, more so than ever, because the kind of economy that's being generated today with the rise of new technology, information, communication, the rise of the service economy generates problems that we haven't even anticipated. Think of our boomer generation that's just entering their retirement years. They are a different kind of retiree than the previous generations. Their needs, their wants. Uh, I'll tell you one statistic. Uh, <laughs> there was a three-year waiting list for adult lectures at my former university. Which was? Uh, uh, at Glendon College in your University. Mm -hmm. uh, three-year waiting list. I wanted to get my parents in. These are lectures that uh, retirees can attend mm -hmm. on a weekly basis. And they pay into a, a small tuition fund that goes and drives university scholarships. Why can't we expand those programs? Because there'll be a growing need. So these opportunities that will arise in a changing uh, economy can't be anticipated. We need creative thinkers. We need people who are uh, able to ask questions and find solutions to problems that we aren't even aware of as existing. And okay. that's not done through an indoctrination program. I hear you. But no. Tony, if, mm -hmm. as we recall on that chart, yes. if your chances of making less money are greater, if you go into the humanities or psychology or philosophy or something like that, should universities still be telling people, come get a bachelor's degree, come get an honors BA at our institution, and in the long run, you'll do better? Yeah, because they will do better. They'll do better than if they didn't go uh, get the bachelor's degree. Financially? I think they will financially, in the big picture, in the small picture. Now, if you look at some of the numbers that were crunched by um, uh, Credit Canada, and uh, one of their policy people looked at what a graduate, a high school graduate would make coming out uh, at 20 years of age, how much they would make, what a community college or a college graduate would make coming out, and what a, a university graduate would make going out. The university graduate at 20 years old would make less than a high school graduate uh, coming out. 
somewhere around the neighborhood of $13,000, $14,000. The college graduate would make roughly $2,000 more. Now, the high school graduate, it would take them 25 years to double that amount. The community college graduate, their money would double in two years. In two instead of 25? No, in two. The university graduate, their number would almost double, uh, multiply by five in two years. Hmm. So they, the pace at which they uh, benefit from the finances, from the investment, is much quicker for both the college graduate and for the, um, and this is across all disciplines. Yeah, you know, but I wonder if that gets us back onto that slippery slope, which is to say that you know, everybody's got their own experience, right? My experience, mm -hmm. when I went to university, nobody said to me, go to this university, it will directly lead you to a job. They didn't say that back then. Right. You went to university because you wanted to be smarter, more educated, better citizen, whatever. Universities seem today to be saying, come to us and we guarantee you're going to get a job at the end of the day. And they shouldn't be saying that. No, I, I, I don't, I don't, I, I, I'm not sure these universities are saying they guarantee a job. I, I think there's, there's a mistake. But that's in, part of the pitch today. And that whole thing. That, Go the, into debt and we'll guarantee you a good job at the end of the day. No, the language is, if you come to this university, you will be prepared to take on this kind of work after you leave. That's a different mm -hmm. thing than say, we will guarantee and several institutions in the states, mostly for private, uh, private for profit institutions, have gotten into trouble guaranteeing these type of things because it's contractual for some people. Right? Okay, but Raphael, even if not guaranteeing, yeah. They, yeah. they are incorporating some aspects of what we think of the college system as doing, more practical hands on skills yeah. at universities, yeah. because they're trying to make that direct line between come to my institution, we'll get, guarantee a degree, at the, uh, guarantee yeah. a job at the end of it. Yeah. You can't do that. No, but it's a response to something else, I think. And it just sort of occurred to me that it's sort of a, in a weak economy, we hang on to what where we can hold on to, right? Mm -hmm. So we're all struggling. These are low growth times. And when you have a low growth equilibrium, as we've had in Canada for the last uh, half decade, um, it's hard to generate new jobs. So people are graduating, not finding work. Not because they've chosen the wrong field, but because there's no demand. There's no growth potential. The work is not there to be had. Exactly. So as a response, I think universities feel pressure and they respond with okay more internships which are linked yeah. to getting yep. your first door foot in the door better not be LinkedIn. false advertising though no they, they it feels a bit like they, that they the, yeah. the programs that do no what the pressure comes from is to offer these programs that do in fact lead to a higher probability of job internships changing the mm -hmm. format of your curriculum uh, I don't think they're lying but I think you're right they're repurposing university in a way that it shouldn't uh, the college system was a great invention uh, in fact, William Davis, whose studio is named for it, was, you are in his was, studio. Exactly, was That's a right. brilliant thinker, very innovative in North America. One of the first jurisdictions to establish a college system. And college Oisey, system. by the way. And Oisey, and exactly. Oisey too. Right. Are, Why did they do these things? Because they realized, yeah. even with a university degree, they might there might be uh, jobs out there that require a technical ability, mm -hmm. and that's where you do need indoctrination. You need to really understand the nuts and bolts of a specific. Uh, a pursuit in order to do it well. well. And those are the jobs, those are the opportunities that we should be saying are attached to jobs. But I agree, university should not be held to that standard. It's, it's a different Tony, thing. Yeah, I don't it, think so. In our last minute here, it gets back to one overarching question, which is should one's passion um, and one's work be the same thing? Yes, it's, it's, it's a very Robert Frostish sort of thing. <laughs> you know, your vocation and a vocation should somehow <laughs> melt as one. Um, and and, and I think that's possible in post-secondary education. Of course, there's colleges and there's universities. When you ask the question about what universities should do, this is what universities should do. And I'm going to go out on a limb on this one. You've got 30 seconds to go out on it. I think we should create all programs that are very interdisciplinary. I think we should prepare students for a life that we don't understand <clears throat> right now, but a life where we're going to be constant learners mm -hmm. all the time, where we should be really sensitive and discerning about what problems exist and minds that can, that can address problems as they stand right now. And that should be both in business, education, architecture, and any discipline mm -hmm. should be multidisciplinary and not siloized and balkanized like, like we currently have. That sounds like terrific advice. Well, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, thanks for coming. And we'll Thank see you, you again tomorrow, right? That's right, yes. Okay. Tony Chambers uh, from the... Um, Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, Rafael Gomez, will be back again tomorrow from the University of Toronto. Gentlemen, thanks very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Steve.
Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.